All right. Um, I think we're going to get started here, and uh, I'm going to we're going to kick it off here with our executive director, Wayne Olson. Thanks very much, Carl. It's it's great to see everyone here tonight. There are so many friends that we're, we're here to celebrate. Really, it's the end of an era for fee, but it's the beginning of a much more exciting new era. And so I, I hope this is the nature of a celebration. There, there are many people here who have been friends of fee for decades, who have come from Michigan, Indiana, California, Florida, all over the country, just to be here with us tonight, and we really appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to just give a brief history of what's gone on in this property and why it's so special to us and talk a little about the enduring legacy of Leonard Reed that we take with us to our next, our next stage. Um, let's face it, we, we love this building because of, it means so much to us personally what's happened to us here in our intellectual development, but it's, also, it's very lovable because it's such an anachronism. Okay, let's face it, this is a gorgeous anachronism. It was built in 1888. Uh, it was built by suburban gentry based on family wealth accumulated over three generations starting shortly after the Revolutionary War here in the Hudson Valley. Um, and uh, it was the culmination of the greatest century of wealth building that the world has ever seen. Uh, it became an anachronism approximately one generation later in 1913 with the passage of the income tax. Um, and very shortly after that, the Great Depression of 1920 and 21 finished the job. Oh, what happened to the Depression of 1920 and 21? That was the Depression that uh, there were three presidents who failed to intervene in the Depression of 1920 and became the recovery of 1921. Uh, and the, the, the uh, Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Hoover, was very upset at that, so when he had his chance, he turned the Depression of 1929 into the Depression of 1929 to 1941. <laughs> uh, but, but, but that literally finished the job for this house. And it was, if you can imagine, the, the suburban gentry, what was left of them, could no longer afford, only a nonprofit could afford a property like this. At the time that Leonard Reed bought it in 1946, it had been vacant for five years. Uh, the owners had decamped to, to Baltimore. Uh, they left a caretaker taker in charge, and the price was basically the back taxes. The back taxes were actually quite considerable. At that time, I want to make a point about the income tax. The top marginal income tax rate was 91%. And it, it was that way basically up until Kennedy. Uh, the top estate tax rate was 77%. And we complain here in Westchester about what we think are the highest real estate taxes imaginable. The levies on Westchester property were approximately 5% of value. So at only a nonprofit really could afford to keep a place like this up. And it, it suited our purposes because being, you know, I'll tell you what Leonard Reed's vision was, but basically we went into a business of publishing and education that at that time was a very, very labor-intensive business. And including the outbuildings, we have about 25,000 square feet uh, of space here. Uh, and we accomplish a similar kind of output today in terms of publications and education and so on in 5,000 square feet of uh, normal office space in Atlanta. Everything else we do is outsourced. But here we had file clerks, we had typists, we had layout people, we had inventory stored in the carriage house. We had pickers and packers. We had, you know, we filled this place at that time. And so it was, it was a good transition. Uh, Leonard Reed came here in 1946. Uh, well, he, he himself was not born to uh, three generations of wealth. His family were dirt farmers in Michigan. Uh, and after a couple of business failures, he found his way into uh, Success. He moved out west and went into the business of um, uh, being a trade association, representative, trade association representative and rose to be the chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Los Angeles. Uh, and up until that time, he was kind of an ordinary guy. And he, he, in 1933, he, uh, through a number of people, uh, the influence of a number of people, he became aware of what he called the freedom philosophy. 
and he, it, it filled his soul. It fired him up, and it became the mission for his life. He turned the L.A. Chamber of Commerce uh, into a, a platform for communicating classical liberal principles to everyone who would listen. And that was from 1933 until 1946 when he came back east with the intention of creating a platform that would do on a national level what he had been doing uh, in California. And uh, it's, it's a little hard to compare because at that time, the first thing he did was to set out publishing books that had been out of print for decades uh, or books that would not have existed without Leonard. Uh, one example, this little volume is one of my most treasured um, artifacts. This was given to me by a donor in California. This is uh, a Bastia, that which is seen and that which is not seen. It's, it's a very clunky, old-fashioned translation, which R.C. Hoyles bought in a used bookstore in London. It was totally out of print, and he had it reprinted at the Santa Ana Register and, you know, charged a buck a piece, and he tried to give it out to as many people who would listen. Uh, and, and Leonard <coughs> said that was great, but he read it, and he, he commissioned a new translation of everything that Bastiat wrote, and Fee became the publisher of the complete works of Bastiat. Human Action was prepared, the manuscript was prepared here at Fee because Ludwig von Mises, although he was a professor of economics at NYU at that time, he had no secretary, and he had no means to get a book published. Uh, not only did he prepare the manuscript here, but uh, Leonard assured its publication by Yale University Press by guaranteeing the first 500 copies, which he then distributed free to every library in America, or that he, uh, the academic library. Um, Bastiat's The Law, which was translated by Dean Russell, has, has been perennially Fee's bestseller ever since, and we've, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of copies have, have gone through here. According to Israel Kersner, he had a major role in the revival of the Austrian School of Economics. According to many uh, at that time, the, we had a major role in the, the founding of the Mont Pelerin Society. Um, and a number of testimonials in the 50th anniversary edition of the Freeman uh, show that we had a significant influence on the founders of the Hudson Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Liberty Fund, the Universidad Francisco Marroquin, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, now the Atlas Network, the uh, Reason Foundation, the Pioneer Institute, the Institute for Humane Studies, the Foundation for Ameri Fund for American Studies, Laissez-Faire Books, Future Freedom Foundation, the Institute for Justice, the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, the Leadership Institute, the Cato Institute, the Independent Institute, and the list goes on and on. This really was the beginning for a lot of people in their intellectual and, and moral and emotional journey. At the time, uh, I, I want to read you some uh, alternative testimonials that appeared in the popular press. Uh, the, the syndicated columnist Drew Pearson. Anybody remember Drew Pearson? Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> He called the Foundation for Economic Education, and I quote, a mysterious organization of vigorous lobby aimed at wrecking the European recovery program that has been flooding the country with propaganda aimed at undermining the Marshall Plan, rent control, aid to education, and social security. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have other commentaries. A left-wing pu uh, uh, publication called Ammunition characterized the Foundation for Economic Ed Education as being set up with plumbing that included a pipeline into the treasury of every big corporation in America. <laughs> and uh, there, were, there was a House, uh, the House Select Committee on Lobbying took a tremendous interest in fee. And the Democratic, uh, it was then controlled by the Democratic majority, uh, Carl Albert of Oklahoma of Oklahoma commented that Leonard Reed um, was far more effective uh, in, in his educational organization than the average buttonhole artist so-called in the Capitol building. Uh, and the House Select Committee set out to determine whether or not new legislation was needed to regulate lobbyists and to include the Foundation for Economic Education in that category. 
however, the Republican minority refused to sign the report from the committee. Leonard Reed testified before the committee. Uh, considering it too biased, and uh, the, the Republican minority report was that it was designed only to help leftists now running for office. Does that sound familiar? Um, there, there are many, many testimonials to fee in the, 20, in the 50th anniversary edition from 1996, but I'd, I'd only want to mention two. Uh, one is from uh, a gentleman named Larry Reed, who was then the uh, president of the uh, Mackinac Institute in Michigan. And uh, he wrote, when G.K. Chesterton was asked why there were no statues in England to commemorate the influence there of the Romans. He answered, are we not all statues to the Romans? In a very real, real way, statues to the foundation for economic education are everywhere in the form of people and institutions that seek to advance the ideas that have been nurtured for years by fee when those ideas were not popular. I'd also mention a, a note by Gary North, who particularly noted that it, it was a, a uh, distinguishing feature of FEE that it is, as he put it, the only organization that introduces newcomers to the idea of the free market as a moral institution, not just as a means of efficient production. And just as a brief historical note, uh, and then I'll, uh, we can move on to the business of the evening. Uh, Paul Poirot, who was uh, an editor of the Freeman for many years, and was, was himself cited as, as a key mentor by uh, Kim Strassel of the Wall Street Journal when she won the Bradley Award this year. Um, he had some interesting historical perspectives on fee, and he talked about the pivotal role played by Bob Anderson, who helped to keep the operation together after the death of Leonard Reed in 1983 and through a succession of short-term presidents until Hans Senholtz took up the position in the early 90s. Uh, he said, perhaps the most outstanding contribution that Bob Anderson made to the Freeman was to bring Beth Herbener Hoffman aboard as the production editor. Eventually, she became the managing editor, and Beth held that position until her untimely death, which occurred here in this building in 2008. During the time that I was privileged to know her, she maintained an apartment upstairs at the top of that circular staircase that looks like only a geisha get it, could get up. <laughs> and she lived there from Sunday night to Friday afternoon, commuting back to her home in New Jersey for the weekends. She was the most tireless and dedicated worker on behalf of Liberty that I've ever known. Uh, a phenomenal networker who seemed to know everyone and really enjoyed getting to know everybody that came through this building. Uh, Beth was definitely old school. She wouldn't tolerate snoppiness anywhere in the Freeman, and she hated typos so bad. Uh, she hated unverified facts, flimsy logic, poor grammar, poor construction. Uh, as Paul Poirot said of Bob Anderson, I would say of Beth Hoffman that she was an enormous force for holding fee together through many difficult uh, transitions. I know that the, the troubles of fee took an enormous emotional toll on her, uh, but her spirit ne never failed. Uh, I know that she would be sad to see her old home go, but she would be thrilled to see the work of fee carried on uh, as one of the primary organizations today that still introduces newcomers to the idea of the free market as a moral institution and not just as a means of efficient production. With that, I think Carl has a couple of announcements. Thank you, thank you, Wayne. Uh, just a few things before we, we uh, bring Larry up. Um, <clears throat> one, I'm sure many of you know that we had a auction uh, online and in person the last couple of events here at FEE. Uh, all, all of those uh, items sold. Um, are we okay? <laughs> uh, all, all those items sold, so we're, uh, uh, we want to thank everybody who uh, participated in the auction. Um, and um, uh, I know a number of you are here tonight, so if you uh, 
want to talk about taking your item, please see me, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get that to you. Um, there are actually two items that did not sell. One is a, uh, a, a plate from a, from a, a golf club here in Westchester County that Leonard Reed had. Uh, Leonard was a, a, a fanatical golfer, and so if somebody would like to take a look at that and let me know if you'd like that. We also did not sell a, uh, a five, th excuse me, a five ounce gold coin with Ludwig von Mises' head uh, on it, um, and uh, we're selling that as well. So if anybody is interested in that, please, please see me. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is uh, I'm sure a lot of you are very uh, interested and concerned that gatherings like this continue to take place in New York City and in Westchester. And uh, FEE has formed a strong partnership with the Bastiat Institute. Uh, Bastiat is Institute is an organization uh, around the country and around the world that reaches out to business communities and tries to form uh, uh, discussion groups uh, similar to this one. Uh, and he, uh, the executive director of the Bastiat Institute is here with us tonight, uh, Brad DeVos. Uh, Brad, Brad is right there. Brad and I are also members of the Bearded Guy Club, so if you want to talk about that too, we, we, can, we can talk about that. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a, a good meeting this afternoon with some people uh, here in Westchester and in the city that are interested in keeping this going. If you're interested in participating in that, um, what, we, what we've done is there's some Bastiat Institute materials out in front at the registration desk. We also have a sign-up sheet up, up there. Please put your name on it. Uh, talk to myself, talk to Brad, uh, and uh, we're going to keep this going. Uh, we, we may not, we won't be able to do it here, but we will do it somewhere, and we will continue this type of, uh, this type of activity uh, uh, as long as we can. The last thing uh, before I introduce Larry is, uh, since this is the last event here uh, tonight, uh, we are going to do a champagne toast uh, after we're done, uh, after Larry's done with his remarks. And so what I'd ask is, after the Q&A session, actually during the last question of the Q&A, uh, we're going to start handing out, we're going to do it in here, and we're going to start handing out uh, uh, champagne flutes to everybody. Uh, so um, once we start the last question, try to clear the aisle. A few staff will be coming through, handing those out. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll do that as soon. Uh, Larry will will do the toast uh, as as soon as he's done with that uh, final question. And with that, uh, I will. Uh, oh, uh, please turn off your cell phones uh, as as a reminder. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for doing that. Um, and with that, I will uh, introduce Larry. I am not going to read the extensive Larry Reed biography that you will find on Fee's website and in many other places. Um, all I'll say is that uh, Larry has been the uh, president of Fee since 2008. For 20 years before that, he was the president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Michigan. He is a tireless uh, advocate for liberty, not only here in the United States, not only in Michigan, not only in Georgia, but everywhere on the planet. He traveled the world, uh, spreading the message of liberty. He risked his life on many occasions in places like Nicaragua and Mozambique. Uh, he has just been a, a godsend to us here at FEE and, a, uh, a, a, like I said, a tireless advocate uh, that I don't think will ever stop. So let's not let him stop now. Come on up, Larry. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin with a few introductions. Uh, first of all, I know we have at least two uh, sitting trustees of the FEE Board of Trustees present tonight. I want you to uh, uh, acknowledge them. We have Don Smith, who's been on the board for a number of years from Manhattan. Chris Talley from uh, Indianapolis. Chris is with Liberty Fund, the president of Liberty Fund, and Chris Morin from the Acton Institute in Michigan. Chris, can you stand up? Okay. Any others? Uh, boy, a board of trustees member is one you don't want to miss. Uh, they're my bosses. Any others? Well, I do know that we also have a former uh, board of trustees member, maybe more than one for all that I know, but Mark Spangler, who was on the board when I was way back in the uh, 80s and 90s in Philadelphia. 
Any, anyone else uh, serve on the fee board of trustees before who might be here tonight? Okay. Well, uh, the other person I want to introduce is a very special friend. He is my successor at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, where I served as president uh, before coming to FEE, uh, and uh, has done a marvelous job. As uh, was our plan, it was a seamless transition, and the organization committed to the same ideals, though focused on uh, the state of Michigan, uh, the same ideals that FEE is, uh, has continued to prosper under his leadership. His name is Joe Lehman. He's the president of the Mackinac Center, and he's here to say a few words. This is his first time to fee, by the way, so it's a very special occasion. Joe. I'll try to speak without uh, the aid of Carl's microphone, but uh, thank you very much, Larry. And it is, uh, it's truly a, a delight to be here. And I have to admit, I, I'm going to claim a little special privilege here tonight because I'm sure that I have the privilege of having worked shoulder to shoulder with Larry Reed longer than anyone else in this room for 13 years, every day. Uh, I don't think we missed a day. No. And there were some days I didn't. seemed like two or three days. <laughs> and the secret to success of working with Larry is no matter how many times he fires you, you just keep coming back to work. <laughs> And I am, I am so delighted to see someone who I mentored all those years and do something, do such great work at FEE. And I think Larry is exactly, uh, exactly what FEE needed in 2008 and exactly the right person at FEE's period of transition, uh, period of transition now. If you don't know it yet, now, Larry is a pathological optimist, and I mean that in the positive sense, a pathological optimist. And we have to have some of that in all of us to keep, uh, to keep fighting uh, for, for freedom. The rumors that you hear about Larry's good work uh, are probably true. I may or may not have edited a few of Larry's <laughs> Freeman columns before they went to the Freeman uh, back in the 1990s. And I can tell you they did not need very much editing. But as Larry said, this is my first time here at Irvington and perhaps my last. But I have always known this campus as a venerated place. And I believe that I may be emblematic of how FEE's ideas transcend any place. It is the ideas of FEE that animated me to quit a perfectly good job in the engineering world and join the Liberty Movement, working with Larry uh, back in 1995. And it is those ideas that have animated countless others uh, to carry forth, uh, carry forth these ideals. Liberty has never sunk permanent roots in any one place. Uh, that is both that is both good news and it is a warning, isn't it? If we want liberty to take root, we must continue to nurture and water and fertilize the place that we are and work for it. Uh, we can't take, can't take anything for granted. But though the home of fee may move around, uh, it doesn't uh, make uh, its ideas uh, any less impactful. Uh, fee's ideas, not its place. It is fee's ideas, not its place, that has put the ideas of liberty and free markets in play in 50 state legislatures, a movement that I've seen grow uh, from small beginnings in the late 1980s until now. It's one reason we have school choice in more than two dozen states, school choice of one measure or another. And uh, to leave out many other successes, I'll just say that it is the idea as a fee that you can draw a direct connection to the fact that Michigan is now a right to work state. We'll just Sophie and Larry and Carl and Wayne have my congratulations and uh, my, my hearty applause. Uh, we, we need you to keep going onward, and we're with you all the way. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for those very kind comments. If I had thought I was half that good, I would have tried more. <laughs> uh, 
As I normally say at the start of these events, but with a slight addendum tonight, welcome to the Foundation for Economic Education, Freedom's home since 1946, wherever we may be. Thank you. Tonight, uh, I'm going to do something a little uh, unique for me. I typically address audiences more from sketchy notes than from a prepared text. But this is such an important occasion, a once-in-a-lifetime occasion, I wanted to be sure that I got it right. And so I want to talk to you tonight from a prepared text, but I've timed it, it's only 25 minutes. And it'll deal with a, a very important series of lessons from one of history's greatest civilizations. For those of you who may have read uh, some things I've written on Rome or heard other speeches, you'll recognize uh, some familiar passages. But there are some things in here tonight that no one here has heard. So I hope you'll uh, bear with me. I want to begin with a quote from the Roman historian Levy, who wrote this 2,000 years ago. There is an exceptionally beneficial and fruitful advantage to be derived from the study of the past. There you see, set in the clear light of historical truth, examples of every possible type. From these, you can select for yourself and for your country what to imitate and also what, as being mischievous in its inception and disastrous in its consequences, you should avoid. That's Levy, 2,000 years ago. The history of ancient Rome, the society which gave birth to Levy, spans a thousand years. Roughly 500 as a republic with protections for basic liberties and 500 as an imperial autocracy, with the birth of Christ occurring almost precisely in the middle. The closest parallels between Roman and American civilizations are to be found in Rome's first half millennia as a republic. I know quite often people will talk about the parallels in the second half of Rome's millennia, but I think the more instructive lessons come from the first half, from Rome's birth as a republic and ultimately the uh, extinction of that republic and then to be followed by the rise of an imperial autocracy. Uh, the tyranny of the empire of that autocracy came after the republic was destroyed, and that's the truly awful consequence of decay that places like America, and ho America can hopefully yet avoid. Both Rome and America were born in revolt against monarchy, Americans against the British and Romans against the Etruscans. Wary of concentrated authority, both established republics with checks and balances, separation of powers, and protection of certain rights of at least many people, if not all. Despite shortcomings, the establishment of the Roman Republic in the 6th century A BC and the American Republic in the 18th century AD represented the greatest advances for individual liberty in the history of the world unparalleled prosperity and influence resulted in both cases. Upon winning their freedom, Romans split the top positions of power between two men, the consuls. One was to be a check upon the other, and neither, except in emergency situations, was to serve more than one year. Legislative, so term limits aren't all that recent. <laughs> Legislative bodies, the Senate and assemblies of elected representatives were established. And incidentally, the Senate was retained in name, if not in power, for the entire thousand years of Roman history. Even as freedom vanished, the later tyrants couldn't quite bring themselves to abolish the symbols of republicanism. So if America ever loses its republic, it wouldn't be surprising to me if it kept its House and Senate. As in the case of Rome, our legislative bodies may even formally ratify the final extinction of the freedom they've been voting against for decades. Let me share with you what I call the three most stubborn lessons of history. And then I'll go back and briefly relate each to the Roman Republic. And the first one is, no people who have lost their character kept their liberties. And I know of no exception to this in all of history. No people who lost their character, as I defined it, kept their liberties. Number two, 
Power that is shackled and dispersed is preferable to power that is unrestrained and centralized. And number three, the here and now is rarely as important as tomorrow. Now to the first of these three. No, no people who lost their character kept their liberties. Character, as I'm using the term, embodies the trait of virtue, which is from the Latin virtus, meaning courageous honesty. Above all, it was esteemed by the early Romans of the Republic. It was routinely taught in the homes by mothers and fathers. Indeed, all formal education took place in the home in the first two and a half centuries of the Roman Republic. Schools didn't appear until the third century BC, and even then, they did not receive government funding until well after the Republic had faded. I guess the lesson there is that uh, government funding is not necessary for the decline of civilization, but it sure helps. <laughs> Other traits of character stressed in early Rome were gravitas, or dignity, continentia, self-discipline, industria, diligence, benevolentia, goodwill, pietas, loyalty and a sense of duty, and simplicitas, which meant candor. The connection between character and liberty, both in Roman history and in ours, is powerful. Liberty, by which I mean the rule of law, respect for and protection of the lives, rights, property, and contracts of others, is the only social arrangement that requires high standards of character. No other system, especially socialism and all of its variants, asks much of you other than keep quiet, pay your taxes, and go get yourself killed when the state so directs. The absence of character produces chaos and tyranny. Its presence is what makes liberty possible. Well, Rome rose from nothing and sustained itself as a great entity for centuries, largely because of its strong and early character. When Romans allowed the temptation of the welfare state to erode their character, when they abandoned responsibility, self-discipline, self-reliance, respect for the property of others, when they began to use government to rob Peter to pay Paul, they turned down a fateful and destructive path. How many of you remember a man associated with Fee for a number of years, late economist Howard E. Kirshner, who wrote a great book uh, once called Dividing the Wealth, as well as others, something called Kirshner's First Law has a lot to say about the rise and fall of Rome and maybe other places too. It reads, when a self-governing people confer upon their government the power to take from some and give to others, the process will not stop until the last bone of the last taxpayer is picked bare. The only quarrel I have with that is that it sounds inevitable, that once you start, you can't turn around. But if we thought that at fee, we wouldn't be working for what we know uh, to be right and to be a better future but it is instructive nonetheless. In the waning years of the Roman Republic, a rogue named Clodius ran for the office of tribune on a platform of free wheat for the masses. He won. Thereafter, Romans in growing numbers embraced the notion that voting for a living could be more lucrative than working for one. Candidates for Roman office spent huge sums to win public favor, then plundered the population afterwards to make good on their promises to the greedy mob that had elected them. As the Republic gave way to dictatorship, a succession of emperors built their power on the handouts that they controlled. Nearly a third of the city of Rome received public relief payments by the time of the birth of Christ. The historian H.J. Haskell describes this, the tragic turn of ideas and events around the first century B.C., first century A.D. And he says this, Less than a century after the Republic had faded into the autocracy of the empire, the people had lost all taste for Republican institutions. On the death of an emperor, the Senate debated whether or not to restore the Republic but the commons preferred the rule of an extravagant despot who would continue the dole and furnish them free shows. The mob outside the Senate clamored for one ruler of the world. It's frightening, isn't it? 
to consider how easily, easily a sturdy people, when they let their guard and their character down, can be bought and paid for by the welfare state. And once they sell themselves for that mess of pottage from politicians, it's not impossible to turn back, but it's not easy either. Now to the second lesson. Power that is shackled and dispersed is preferable to power that is unrestrained and centralized. Just like Americans, 2,500 years later, Romans got it right when they determined at their nation's birth that concentrated power was the main problem of governance. It was the source of endless other problems, too. They and we once understood the wisdom of Lord Acton's famous admonition, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I always like to add my own corollary to that, power attracts the already corrupted. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> power concentrates because that's what power does if the people are not vigilant. In Rome, cities and provinces lost their independence to the central government after demanding funds from that government to bail them out of financial difficulty. The greatest of all Roman historians, Tacitus, noted how freedom was undermined when the focus of Roman legislation changed from the security and good of all to the satisfaction of particular individuals and interest groups, in his words. And now bills were passed, not only for national objects, but for individual cases, and laws were most numerous when the Commonwealth was most corrupt. In 33 AD, well after the demise of the Republic, a financial panic gripped Rome. The government responded by a massive issuance of zero interest credit. Businesses that happily took the bait found themselves later thoroughly ensnared. After all, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Roman leaders increasingly sought power not only against their own people but over others as well. They embarked upon one foreign adventure after another, at first for the security of Rome, later often for the sake of domination or plunder. Add the costs of empire to the costs of a welfare state, and eventually bills come due that even the most power-mad tax collector cannot pay without cheating the people of a sound currency. The Emperor Nero, in 54 AD, and by the way, Nero is known for other things, but he may have been the father of urban renewal, but he once rubbed his hands together, according to the Roman historian Suetonius, and declared, let us tax, let us tax again, let us tax until no one owns anything. He was also the first emperor to debase the Roman coin by reducing its silver content. Power is an exceedingly dangerous thing in the hands of anybody, any government. This popular quote is often attributed to George Washington, and though that's never been verified, it nonetheless sounds like something almost any of our founders could have said, or would certainly have agreed with. Government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. And like fire, it can be either a dangerous servant or a fearful master. Now to the third lesson. The here and now is rarely as important as tomorrow. Early Romans, as with early Americans, built and planned and lived for the future. They sacrificed present gratification so the future would be better. Then there came a time in both societies when living for the moment ruled the day. The feeling was, get what you can now, regardless of the cost or who pays for it, or how untenable a situation it may cause for you or for the next generation tomorrow. If problems arise, somebody down the road will figure it out after we're gone. We've heard talk in recent years in this country that certain companies are, quote, too big to fail. But in dealing with that imaginary short-term problem, we've handed huge chunks of our lives and economy over to a government that is now arguably too big to succeed. Rome did precisely the same thing. Live for the moment, damn the future, après le, moi le deluge, as the French say. You might ask, was there a reason why I spent a little more time on the first lesson than I did the second and the third? And yes, there is. Character is the key. If you've noticed, it's become an increasing focus 
of fee in explaining the connection to young audiences between liberty and character. It's everything, really. Little of value is possible without it, without character. And there's hardly any better use of time than to study men and women who possess it or possessed it in copious quantities. And now I'd like to tell you about one such person from Roman times. I have a question for you first, however. Have you ever thought about if you could go back in time and spend one hour in conversation with ten people, each one separately and privately, whom would you choose? You ever thought about that? Give it some thought over coming days, because who you choose will say a lot about your interests and, uh, and other things about you, I think. Who would you most like to spend an hour with if you could go back in time and meet with any ten people one at a time? My list isn't exactly the same from one day to the next, but at least a couple names are always on it, without fail. And one of them is Marcus Tullius Cicero. He was the greatest citizen of the greatest ancient civilization, Rome. He was its most eloquent orator and its most distinguished man of letters. He was elected to its highest office, as well as most of the lesser ones that were of any importance at all. More than anyone else, he introduced to Rome the best of the ideas of the Greeks. More of his written and spoken work survives to this day, including hundreds of speeches and letters than that of any other historical figure before 1000 AD. Most importantly, he gave his life for peace and liberty as the greatest defender of the Roman Republic before it plunged into the darkness of a welfare warfare state. Cato Institute scholar Jim Powell opened his remarkable book, The Triumph of Liberty, a 2,000 year history told through the lives of freedom's greatest champions, with a chapter on this Roman hero. A chapter he closed with this fitting tribute, quote, Cicero urged people to reason together. He championed decency and peace, and he gave the modern world some of the most fundamental ideas of liberty. At a time when speaking freely was dangerous, he courageously denounced tyranny. He helped keep the torch of liberty burning bright for more than 2,000 years, so says Jim Powell. And to that I would add he was also the greatest defender of the Roman Constitution as it was under sustained assault of power seekers and the welfare warfare state. Who wouldn't want to have an hour with this man? It's not the magnificent buildings in which Cicero spoke, the Senate, the Forum, for example, which deserve our admiration. It's the man and his ideas. P.J. Uh, PJ O'Rourke uh, recently said, the Romans have had 2,000 years to fix up the Forum and just look at the place. <laughs> Marcus Tullius Cicero was born in 106 BC in the small town of Arpinum, about 60 miles southeast of Rome. He began practicing law in his early 20s. His most celebrated case, which he won, required him to defend a man accused of murdering his father. He secured an acquittal by convincing the jury that in fact the real murderers were closely aligned to the highest public officials in Rome. It was the first, but not the last time, that he put himself in grave danger for what he believed to be right. Roman voters rewarded Cicero with victory in one office after another as he worked his way up the ladder of government. Along the way, the patrician nobility of Rome never quite embraced him because he hailed from a slightly more humble class, the so-called equestrian order, mainly merchants. He reached the pinnacle of office in 63 BC when at the age of 43, Romans elected him co-consul. The consulship, as I mentioned earlier, was Rome's highest office through authority, uh, though authority under the Roman constitution was shared between two co-equal consuls. One could veto the decisions of the other and both were limited to a single one year term. Cicero's co-consul, a man you probably never have heard of, Gaius Antonius Hybrida, was so overshadowed by his colleague's eloquence and magnetism that he's but a footnote today. In contrast, Cicero emerged as the savior of the Republic amid a spectacular plot 
to snuff it out. The ringleader of a vast conspiracy to snuff out the Roman Republic was a senator named Lucius Sergius Catiline. How many have heard of Catiline before? This disgruntled, power-hungry Roman, and a senator no less, assembled an extensive work, a network of fellow travelers, including some of the senators. The plan was to ignite a general insurrection across Italy, march on Rome with the aid of mercenaries, assassinate Cicero and his co-consul, seize power, and crush all opposition. Cicero learned of the plot and quietly conducted his own investigations. Then in a series of four powerful orations you can read to this day, orations before the Senate, with Catiline himself present for the first, he cut loose. The great orator mesmerized the Senate with these opening lines of his first speech and the blistering indictment that followed. He said, how long, O Catiline, will you abuse our patience? And for how long will that madness of yours mock us? To what end will your unbridled audacity hurl itself? Before Cicero was finished, Catiline fled the Senate. He rallied his dwindling army, but was ultimately killed in battle. Other top conspirators were exposed and disposed of. Cicero, on whom the Senate had conferred emergency and total power, walked away from that power and restored the Republic. He was given the honorary title of Pater Patriae, Father of the Country. But Rome at the time of the Catalinarian conspiracy was not the Rome of two or th three centuries before when honor, virtue, and character were the watchwords of Roman life. By Cicero's time, the place was rife with corruption and power lust. The outward appearances of a republic were undermined daily by civil strife in a growing welfare warfare state. Many who gave lip service in public to republican values were privately conniving to secure power or wealth through their political connections. Others were corrupted or bribed into silence by government handouts. The Republic was on life support, and Cicero's voice was soon itself to be drowned out by a rising tide of political intrigue and violence and popular apathy. In 60 BC, Julius Caesar, then a senator and military general with boundless ambition, tried to get Cicero to join a powerful partnership that became known as the First Triumvirate. But Cicero's liberty sentiments prompted him to reject the offer out of hand. Two years later, and barely five years after crushing Catiline's conspiracy, Cicero found himself on the wrong side of political intrigue. Political opponents connived to thwart his influence, resulting in a brief exile to northern Greece. He returned, however, to a hero's welcome, but retired to his writing. Over the next decade or so, he gifted the world with impressive literary and philosophical work. One of my favorites being De Officius, or On Duties. In it he wrote, listen to this. Cicero wrote, the chief purpose in the establishment of states and constitutional orders is that of individual property rights, that they might be secured. It is the peculiar function of state and city to guarantee to every man the free and undisturbed control of his own property. Politics, however, would not leave Cicero alone. Rivalry between Caesar and another leading political figure in general, Pompey, exploded in the Civil War. Cicero reluctantly sided with the latter, with Pompey, whom he regarded as the lesser of two evils and less dangerous to the Republic. But Caesar, triumphed over Pompey, who was killed in Egypt, and then he cowed the Senate into naming him dictator for life. A month later, Caesar himself was assassinated in the Senate by pro-Republican forces. When Mark Antony attempted to succeed Caesar as dictator, it was Cicero who spearheaded the Republican cause once again. He delivered a series of 14 powerful speeches known in history, still readable today, and known in history as the Philippics. Cicero's oratory never soared higher. With the remnants of the Republic hanging by a thread, he threw the scroll at Antony. The would-be dictator, Cicero declared, was nothing but a bloodthirsty tyrant-in-waiting. Quote, 
I fought for the Republic when I was young, he asserted. I shall not abandon her in my old age. I scorn the daggers of Catiline. I shall not tremble before yours. Rather, I would willingly expose my body to them if by my death the liberty of the nation could be recovered and the agony of the Roman people could at last bring to birth that which is, it has so long been in labor. Antony and his fellow conspirators named Cicero an enemy of the state, a badge which I'm sure he wore with honor. They sent an assassin, Herennius, to take him out. On the 7th of December, 43 BC, the killer found his target. The great statesman bared his neck and faced his assailant with these last words. There was nothing proper about what you were doing, soldier, but do try, do try to kill me properly. With one sword stroke to the neck, the life of the last major obstacle to dictatorship was extinguished. At that moment, the 500-year-old Roman Republic expired too, to be replaced by the imperial dictatorship we briefly have discussed. Roman liberty was gone. On the orders of Antony, Cicero's hands were severed and nailed along with his head to the speaker's platform in the Roman Forum. Antony's wife personally pulled out Cicero's tongue and in a rage against his oratory, stabbed it repeatedly with her hairpin. Jim Powell reports in The Triumph of Liberty that a century after that ghastly deed, the Roman writer Quintilian declared that Cicero was, quote, the name not of a man, but of eloquence itself. Thirteen centuries later, when the printing press was invented. The first book it produced was, of course, the Gutenberg Bible, but you may not know that the second was Cicero's dissertation on duties. Three more centuries passed when Thomas Jefferson called Cicero, quote, the first master of the world. And John Adams proclaimed that, quote, all the ages of the world have not produced a greater statesman and philosopher than Marcus Tullius Cicero. Well, some might say that Cicero's labors to save the Roman Republic were, at least in hindsight, a waste of time. He gave his life for an ideal that he was able to extend tenuously for maybe a couple of decades. But if I had an hour with Cicero, I would thank him. I would want him to know of the inspiration he remains to lovers of liberty everywhere, more than two millennia after he lived. I would share with him one of my favorite remarks about heroism from the screenwriter and film producer Joss Whedon. Quote, the thing about a hero is, even when it doesn't look like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, he's going to keep digging. He's going to keep trying to do right and make up for what's gone before because that's who he is. And that is exactly who Cicero was. Do we Americans of 2014 have the character to preserve our liberties? That's the $64,000 question, isn't it? That sounds like such a small amount these days. After <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the $564,000 question. By almost any measure, the standards that we as citizens keep and expect of those we elect have slipped badly in recent years. Though everybody complains about politicians who pander, Perhaps they do it because we're increasingly a panderable people. Too many are willing to look the other way when politicians misbehave, as long as they're of the right party or deliver the goods that we personally demand. Our celebrity-drenched culture focuses incessantly on the vapid and the irresponsible. Our role models would make our grandparents cringe. We cut corners and sacrifice character all the time for power, money, or attention, or other ephemeral gratifications. Our constitution, like the Roman one, is skirted, misinterpreted, and all but ignored by our highest authorities, but so many Americans seem not to care. Bad character leads to bad policy and bad economics, which is bad for liberty. Without character, a free society is not just unlikely, it's not possible. I will close by asking and then answering an important question. To avoid the fate of the dead and buried Roman Republic, 
what do we need in America to do today? This comes from someone I don't know, although I've doubled it in size and added a lot of my own verbiage, but I wish I could give credit to the person who first came up with elements of this. But it reads as follows, whoever wrote it. America needs more men and women who do not have a price at which they can be bought, who do not borrow from integrity to pay for expediency, who have their priorities straight and in proper order, whose handshake is an ironclad contract, who are not afraid of taking risks to advance what is right, who are honest in small matters and in large, who treat the rights and property of others as they would expect others to regard theirs. America needs more men and women whose ambitions are big enough to include others, who know how to win with grace and lose with dignity, who do, do not believe that shrewdness and cutting and ruthlessness are the three keys to success, who still have friends that they made 20 or 30 years ago, who put principle and consistency above politics or personal advancement, and who are not afraid to go against the grain of popular opinion, and who regard their own self-reliance and responsibility as infinitely more sacred than a handout from the government. America needs more men and women who do not forsake what is right just to get consensus because it makes them look good, who know how important it is to lead by example, not by barking orders, who would not have you do something they would not do themselves, who work to turn even the most adverse circumstances into opportunities to learn and improve, and who truly love liberty and are eager to give more than lip service to it, and who love even those who have done some injustice or unfairness to them. America, in other words, needs more men and women of character. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We have some time for questions. If I can answer them, I'll do my best. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Should we uh, wait till we have a microphone, yes. right? Okay, sorry. If you wait just a moment, the mic is on the way. Hi. Um, the question I have is my reading about the fall of the Roman Empire includes uh, slavery. Yeah. And uh, you have a very different take. Can you just address the issue of slavery yes. and how that led to unemployment in your yes. vision there? Okay. The question has to do with Roman slavery. And I only uh, uh, obliquely referenced it early on when I mentioned that Roman liberty was guaranteed to some, but not all, uh, which was also the case uh, for the first uh, uh, many decades here in America. Slavery was always in existence in Rome. The only thing you can say on behalf of the Romans was it was less prevalent and less brutal in much of the Roman world during the Roman Republic than it, than it would become later in the empire or that it was in much of the rest of the world. And there's no way you could ever argue that slavery benefited Roman society in the long run as it was harmful to America or to any society it was harmful to Rome as well. So as much as I would love to say that Rome extended liberty to every living soul, it never quite went that far. But it went further than any people before it, and than any people would go until the birth of America many centuries later. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I meant uh, how slavery led to the unemployment of the common oh, yes. okay. Romans that then that's how the... That was an issue, circuses, yes. You know, it was yeah. this vicious domino effect. Yeah. Late in the Republic, uh, there were many examples of where uh, uh, the, the well-to-do used their political power to deploy slave labor on their plantations, putting out of business many private small farmers. Uh, and then the appearance of the Gracchus brothers, who were among the, among the first, not the first, first in a big way, to start offering the public dole, was an attempt to address this. 
uh, it was not the proper way to do it. The proper way would have been to uh, to stop the political favors that allowed the well-to-do to use their power to uh, enslave people at, at the expense of both those enslaved and the uh, uh, free labor uh, uh, farms that they competed with. Uh, but that's the way Rome went, uh, in the direction of a dole, partly as a response to the impact of slavery. Uh, so it was a very negative influence in many ways. Yep. Yes, Herb? Uh, uh, microphone? Okay, who, he's got it. Who are some of your other top ten folks you'd want to spend an hour with from history? Oh. <clears throat> Who would be among my top ten? Well, the, another one that's always on that list, of course, is Christ. And uh, whether you are a Christian or not, uh, I would think you might want to consider putting him at the top of the list simply because of the uh, monumental impact he had and the incredible message that he, that he offered. Uh, so he would certainly be there. Uh, Grover Cleveland, my favorite president. I, want to, I met his son. I just haven't met him. Uh, so I'd like to meet him. Um, Oh, another one would be, uh, here's a name you won't know, perhaps, but um, her name is uh, the Duchess of Ethel, Catherine Ethel, A-T-H-O-L-L. -L. Remarkable woman, one of those, I'm just so sad that we've forgotten about her. Uh, in the 1930s, she, she was only the third woman ever elected to the British Parliament. And because she was principled to the core in favor of all the things we are here, free markets, less government, and in foreign policy, she was in favor of non-intervention, but a strong defense for Britain against uh, any aggressor. Uh, uh, she saw the threat of Hitler early and incurred the wrath of her own party, the leadership of her own party, Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister, uh, much of the time she was in parliament, on down as she spoke out against the rise of Hitler and against the rise of socialism at home. A uh, remarkable woman who, uh, in 1931, by the way, she wrote a, wonderful, very academic, scholarly, and blistering indictment of Soviet communism that any of us here would find of great value to this day. So she, I'd love to have time with her uh, just because of uh, what she said and what she did, what she stood for in spite of... Uh, she was a Thatcher long before Thatcher, you might say. Um, oh, another one would be uh, David Livingston, the great missionary and explorer love to spend time with him to talk about uh, his anti-slavery efforts as well as his uh, quest to find the source of the uh, Nile and uh, his uh, uh, endless efforts against the, uh, the slave trade. William Wilberforce, for whom one of my dogs is named. Uh, <laughs> and Thomas Clarkson, his right-hand man, for whom my other dog is named. I would love to meet both of them, champions in the anti-slavery effort uh, in Britain in the late uh, 18th century, early 19th. Uh, oh, Harriet Tubman, one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad, uh, who once said that she could have freed so many more if only she had convinced them that they, in fact, were slaves. Uh, remarkable woman. There's something very close to that, anyway, if I didn't get it quite right. Uh, uh, maybe I'll think of some more, but those are certainly a high on my list. Any of the framers? Oh, the framers, absolutely, yeah. Probably George, uh, George uh, Mason more than any a leading uh, anti-federalist and uh, very uh, uh, eloquent uh, speaker from Virginia. George Mason, for sure. Uh, oh, I'd love to have a moment in Washington, even though uh, I probably would have been of the other party. Uh, I would have... Love to, I would love to have a moment with him to thank him for the example that he set in so many ways because our country could have gone a very different direction had it not been for the example that our first president set. Uh, so, yeah, he, he's a hero. Um, well, those are a few. Yes, sir? If you were in your carry the leader reform movement, what would be the three most basic reforms you would recommend uh, to try to avoid what, what seems to be taking place in America? What would be the three most, uh, reforms uh, the three biggest reforms I would suggest if I, yeah. if, if I could somehow make them happen? <laughs> By the way, I want to mention another name before I get to your question, because he's local. Uh, a man that every New Yorker should know. One of the greatest, most eloquent spokespersons for liberty that the U.S. Congress has ever had. He would have been president had it not been for, for the fact that he was born in Ireland. But he was a congressman spanning something like, 
uh, 35 years, but not all of that time. He'd serve for a couple terms, go back to work in Manhattan, and then a few years later run again, get elected for a term, and go back home. His name was Burke Cochran. He's buried not far from here. Wayne and I have visited his gravesite. C-O-C-K-R-A-N. If you go to our website, type in that name, you'll read uh, about Burke Cochran. Steve Horwitz, as an Austrian economist, would especially appreciate this. In 1893, Burke Cochran gave an address in Congress, almost from memory, not from prepared text. Sketchy notes at best. Uh, it was a two and a half hour history of money and banking. And decades before Mises, he's in Congress saying every crisis in the economy has been preceded by an inflation of money and credit by the government. And he goes back and cites instance after instance, both in British history and the United States. Uh, and he was right on every other issue, too, and very outspoken. Burke Cochran, you can still find uh, biographies of him, and he's a local guy, right from uh, New York City. Can you imagine that city electing somebody like him a day? <laughs> we got our work cut out for us. What three reforms would I put in place? Keep in mind that ours is not a push-button solution. I, I, I sympathize with the question. I wish it were. But ultimately, I don't want to, for, the mo for any moment, get you thinking that there's some quick fix to our problems. Because ultimately, it's a long-term process of character rebuilding on the part of all of us. And then the policies take care of themselves. But if I could implement three reforms at the policy level, probably... Uh, uh, certainly, I would uh, end the Fed. That would be high on the list. Yeah. And I would try to do it in a way that educated the public. I would explain that uh, a markets are uh, – the problem with money is after 100 years of steady erosion in its value and multiple crises stimulated by the agency in charge of it, uh, the problem is putting the market back in charge of money and taking it out of the hand of political appointees try to use it as an educational opportunity. Um, a, a balanced budget amendment would be important. Um, if I could, I would abolish about half or more of the federal government uh, and, and take out whole agencies, whole cabinet departments, root and branch, like commerce, energy, edu you know. Um, but you know, if, if all I could do was just have a half hour on television with the American people, I think I would talk to them about the danger of the erosion of their character and why all the issues that seem to animate their conversations and their concerns today from a $17.5 trillion national debt to out-of-control spending and regulations, I would try to convince them that all of that stems from this erosion of character. And if we don't come to grips with it, we will suffer the fate of every nation that has seen its character suffer, and that is liberty goes down the tube. That, I, that's such a powerful message, and I'm so privileged, I feel, to be a part of an organization that has made that front and center of our message, because I don't think anybody else is quite doing it the way we are. And uh, where that message is delivered eloquently, it resonates, believe me. Okay. Uh, I don't know who was next, uh, but we should go to the back, somewhere in the back. Sure. Thinking about Cicero for today and realizing the differences in thousands of years, but still trying to transplant Cicero to the U.S. Congress, Senate, or House of Representatives. And without getting partisan, yeah. still his lesson of uh, principle and character and courage and compromise even, uh, what, what would you counsel some of our present congressional leaders as we, we struggle with the uh, upcoming election, the congressional elections, and these big, big, enormous uh, matters of finance and, and uh, responsibility. What would you say that you think might capture the attention of the public and lead to some real changes? Yeah. Well, I, w I think I would start by telling them, look, I could give you policy advice, but that will take care of itself if you fix some other problems first. If you're a public official, I would first start by saying stand for something that's more important than yourself, more important than your own political power and your own political career. Put the country and its future and its liberties first and foremost. If that means, because you're not an eloquent spokesman for it, that you don't survive your re-election, you can at least hold your head high and tell the country you stood for what you believed in and uh, uh, you didn't compromise to, to retain power. The biggest problem in Washington today is power. The love of it, 
the lust for it, the desire to do anything to achieve it, the willingness to cut corners, prevaricate, lie, steal, whatever it takes to keep it at your hands. That's the number one problem. And I would tell them, that's something someday you're going to pay an awful price for unless you change your habits today. Understand liberty because it is the loftiest, noble, most noble earthly ideal I can think of for, for, human, for human existence. That people should be free to be who they are. Uh, left free to their own devices so long as they commit no harm, no violation of the rights and property of others. I would try to re-inspire in them a desire for liberty, not for, for the exercise of power. They probably never hear that message. Do we have time? Okay, a couple more. Uh, Carl, how about the one in the back right next to you? I think you may have answered the first question, which was, um, from where do the criteria that you expressed for the definition of character, from where does it derive? And the secondary question is, what do you tell young people today who, in my view, are unemployable in any institutional, whether it's government, academia, or any major corporation? Yeah. I'm not talking about a mom and pop store. Yeah. Unemployable if they in any way express the character that you advocate? What do you advise them to navigate that situation? Well, I hope I can remember the second as I answer the first. Um, I tell audiences because on this point I am kind of uh, ecumenical in the sense that I don't want to freeze anybody out uh, in their embrace of liberty because of where they may be on matters often regarded as, say, spiritual. Uh, so I want those who may be people of faith as well as people uh, of a different faith or no faith to all understand that as, a, as the very nature of man, the kind of, wherever you think man may come from, uh, the, the, the kind of society that I think all of us ultimately really want is one that recognizes his basic nature, that we do best we will prosper, we'll live in peace with each other to the extent we recognize things like honesty and patience and courage and independence, self-reliance uh, and respect for the lives and property of others. You may be a Christian and say, well, all that comes from God, or you may be uh, a person of another or no faith and still, I think, can say that these things are part of human nature. That. Uh, for humans to survive and to flourish, they must be free wherever you think these important virtues may derive their ultimate command. Oh, and the second, I, 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 I did forget it. Uh, but in the interest of getting some more variety, the limited time we have, I hope you'll not mind if we go to another person. The last question here, so I'm going to ask the staff to start passing out the, the champagne for the toast, okay. so please through the aisle, but we'll let Larry uh, answer this final question here. Uh, Chris Baker right there next to you had his hand up. Uh, you know, one of the creators of character is also having strong families, and we have two things that are declaring war on that. Number one, we have this toxic divorce culture, but number two now, we have all of these busybodies who want to regulate parents yeah. and don't want them don't want to allow them to raise their kids. What can we do about these issues? Well, uh, there's, I guess, a twofold answer to that. Part of it is very personal and, and a, a private matter that individuals must recognize their responsibility of those they've brought into being or those they call their, their family and, uh, and nurture them. Uh, on the policy front, there's so much in government policy today that, oh, oh, so sorry, so sorry. I, that's a very difficult task. Uh, at least, please don't feel bad about that. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, well, uh, it, it, in that vein, you know, government policy for years, welfare in particular, has encouraged the breakup of families. And uh, so we ought to remove root and branch all those policies that, by government uh, decree, uh, make war on the family. Well. Uh, I have a few words as we work our way to uh, our champagne toast tonight, so we'll need a little more time to distribute it, so it's a good thing I've got a few words. <laughs> uh, 
At this time, if I could have your attention, uh, I want to uh, work our way to a closure with a cha champagne toast. In fact, three of them to be precise. So, uh, Steve Horwitz, make sure you don't drink, all, drink it all in the first, first toast. <laughs> this is a way of saying goodbye uh, to this property, but not to you, because we will be back from time to time for events in this area, as Carl alluded to earlier. Irvington will always be home to countless good friends and memories. I want to start by something, repeating something that Wayne said earlier, because it is so important and so fitting. And he referred to what G.K. Chesterton once said when he was asked why there were no statues in England to commemorate the influence of the Romans. You recall what he said? Are we not all statues to the Romans? Well, in a very real way, statues to fee are everywhere in the form of people like you and institutions too numerous to mention that seek to advance ideas planted and nurtured for years by fee when those ideas were not popular. Largely because the persona of Leonard Reed is so firmly embedded in our organization, fee is much more than a single physical place or a publisher of books and articles or a sponsor of seminars and webinars. It is real people committed to ideals that haven't changed in nearly 70 years. People animated by a distinctive style and approach and attitude and demeanor. What do statues to fee look like? Well, they're not made of wood or stone or glass or cement or blacktop. They are infinitely more important than any of those things. Statues to fee are living, breathing human souls who at some point in their lives were touched by the message schooled by fee and sent on their way to spread that message to others. They have smiles on their faces, a spring in their step, and goals to accomplish. They are optimistic men and women of character who will not retire from what they know to be right. They include all of you, each of you. Each of you is a statue to fee. Fee champions ideas, after all, not personalities or bricks and mortar. Once that is understood, new avenues for persuasion open up. The most fruitful way to advance liberty is rarely to assail the intelligence or the motives of others who believe another way. Focusing instead on ideas and appealing to reason are much less likely to provoke hostility, as we all know. That approach, seasoned with patience and a smile, is a vital ingredient in Fee's recipe for winning hearts and minds. Fee promotes self-improvement in place of a condescending know-it-all attitude. If you want to be a missionary for liberty, to be vaguely familiar or generally sympathetic with the concept is not enough. You must know economics, you must know some history, some ethics, and so much more. But ultimately, success in convincing others requires attention to the attractive qualities of a well-rounded individual. Be as good as you can possibly be, Leonard Reed used to say, and others will seek your tutelage. Liberty requires character, and indeed, character requires liberty too. It's a powerful two-edged sword forged in time-honored ideas that have often demanded the best of us in even the worst of times. What a noble and lofty calling, lofty calling our message is. And so it is on this occasion, when I have a soft drink and no champagne. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, I don't want to take your show. Go ahead. I, I can. Forgive me. <laughs> and so it is on this occasion, which can only be described in mix, mixed adjectives, like solemn yet cheerful, sad but joyous, nostalgic while future-focused, and, of course, thankful for so much beyond measure, I am honored Thank you, Skylar. To ask your indulgence in three successive toasts. First, to Fee's history here in this memorable location, purchased and nurtured for nearly seven decades by Leonard Reed, his successors, and Fee's hundreds of staff members and trustees over the years. Amen. Amen. 
Second, to all our friends here and around the world who have made and continue to make FEE's Championship of Liberty possible and whose support of those ideas depends on how faithful we remain to them, not to any particular location from which they emanate. And third, to a bright and energetic future of winning more young minds than ever before to the lofty ideals of human liberty and personal character. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pride and hope, I thank you and I close this chapter in the remarkable history of a venerable organization whose best days are still to come. And I ask you, I implore you, I beseech you to be not just a part of Fee's past, but be a part of Fee's future as well. And we promise, thank you, we promise to remain ever faithful to the values that we share. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.